crack makes the world go round. Simply boil the bear overnight. What's the deal with that? Grab him by the pussy. Do you value home protection and personal security? But do you want to keep your tools out of the wrong hands? Thankfully, there's an easy solution. We're building a cleaner, safer America with GOPS. It's like a social network for your guns. Hello, hello, I'm George. Um, I'm also sorry. I'm gonna be your assistant TA for Metagalology today because uh, Bronson had a foot surprise. I see that. Cell phones, off. Okay, so we're at the fourth seminar for Metal Gear Solid, right? Which means we're at the fourth game of Metal Gear Solid, which means this is the game where Metal Gear Solid begins to get stupid. Uh, yeah, question. I thought it was already stupid. Thanks for that. Yeah, you're right. It already was stupid. But Metal Gear Solid 4 is the game where the stupid takes over. This is the game where the series starts to get way up its ass about its own lore. And it, it feels like after all these years of trying to get out of the Metal Gear game, we finally get to see what it looks like when Kojima makes a Metal Gear he doesn't want to make. Or at least one he didn't expect to make. This is a turning point in the series where you started to see people talk about Metal Gear Solid in general as being dumb, where as before there was a lot more talk about Metal Gear Solid being this edgy, alt-cinema, forward-thinking thing that was growing video games as an art form. It seems like at this one it starts to stop growing. But believe me, there, there was not a game like this before, and there's probably not going to be a game like this after. So where were we? <sighs> right, so EE uploads a virus to Arsenal Gear, which was made by the Navy, but controlled by the Patriots, because they want to crank out a bunch of fake news, because they're the Illuminati controlling everything. As demonstrated by how they fool right into thinking he's a cool guy action hero saving the day at Shadow Moses, when he's really a homicidal maniac with, a, with an identity crisis, and he's also still being strung along by the Patriots, because he's unknowingly protecting Olga's daughter, and they don't let you forget any of that for MGS4. You gotta remember a lot of little stuff from MGS2 for this one. All those crumbs in the carpet gotta get picked out and glued together into something. Metal Gear Solid 4 is the greatest monument to fan service in history. So, okay, just under a decade earlier, Kojima said MGS2 was gonna be his last time directing Metal Gear. That turned out to not be true. Kojima then said MGS3 would be his last, but more games continued to come out past. Metal Gear 1 came out in 1987, and by the time it was 2005, both corporate pressure and fan death threats were urging him back at it again. MGS1 was a do-over of MG2 that Kojima was excited to remake in glorious 3D with cinematic cutscenes and talented voice acting. And then we have MGS2, this deeply personal, postmodern interactive think piece about sequels and internet isolationism, and then we get MGS3, which feels like this attempt to test himself, wipe the slate clean of sequel baggage, and just see if he could make a classic Hollywood three-act, dumb, exciting popcorn action movie just as good as the ones that inspired him. In short, up to this point, the MGS games generally felt like they wanted to be made. They had energy, enthusiasm, and inspiration behind them. The soundtracks were full of cute instrumental motifs that reflected the themes, instead of just generic action movie music. Cute girls would tell you good luck when you save the game. Codec calls were full of little esoteric fun facts and amusing side stories. This reminds me of when we first met. I was the one inside the locker that time. We're equal now, huh? Not unless I wet my pants. That's a low blow, Snake. Gecko! We've got Gecko! Do you have a weapon that would work against those Gecko? Sure do. Okay, great. Use it to get them out of the way. In previous games, characters had senses of humor. They weren't all serious all the time. The games had a sense of humor that was actually funny. In short, MGS4 is the first MGS game that feels like it was made with a sigh instead of a smile. It was made to answer questions that weren't meant to be answered. It feels like instead of being planted by a personal seed of personal inspiration that had been bubbling up for years, this game comes out as a tired fulfillment of fan requests that were so persistent they ended up making this stuff up as they went along. Uh, yes, question. So, what was the deal with that David Hayter interview and stuff? 
the TV programs. Okay, I, I feel like those show the most obvious example that Kojima's missing the, the trees for the forest in this one. They show the single most damning example of, of this misinterpretation of the game's own inspirations. They're great, they're great. They're, they're one of the best parts of Metal Gear Solid 4, don't get me wrong, and, and they begin right when you hit that new game button. The television in Metal Gear Solid 4 is a television from Robocop. It's an earnest, honest, and simple attempt to show how crazy the world has gotten, but you, as an enthusiastic fan, might have thought this was some kind of postmodern avant-garde piece of arthouse genius guesswork when it's a very awkward attempt to just do Robocop. They're a peek at the civilian life in this universe. They're atmospheric, they're creepy, they're quippy, they have this intensely uncomfortable atmosphere about them that I adore, and after the revelations of this Game Informer article, I'm more ready to credit all of that to the American studio they outsource these to. These sections were written by the LA studio, and they were written in English first, and that's a whole topic I'll be getting into later. Until then... We see that the military-industrial complex has grown so far out of control that television is becoming military-themed somehow. You got military-themed cooking shows, game shows, workout programs, and they eventually all cut to a PMC commercial before fading to black, when the power of the PS3 brings us to a loading screen. After fading to black again, we're now in an entirely digital alternate universe away from the real actors of TV without that critical establishing shot or a smooth edit to visualize that those were TV programs within the Metal Gear world, not that the Metal Gear world is just another TV program. The jarring difference between real actors and video game characters is what muddies the execution behind this transition. Although Metal Gear Solid 4 is a fan service game for Metal Gear Solid fans and Metal Gear Solid is a series that loves to weird out its fans, do know that I enjoyed getting weirded out. It's just after uh, all these years of retrospect and interviews and peeks at this sausage factory, I'm suddenly not so sure that getting so weirded out to the point where I didn't even know what I was looking at was actually the intended effect. Anyway, Snake muses on how commercialized war has become as he's on his way to assassinate Liquid in the Middle East. Hey, question. Yeah, why is Snake on his way to assassinate Liquid in the Middle East? I totally forgive you for not knowing that, because I assume that most of you hit the new game button when wanting to start the video game, but you should actually hit the briefing button! The Colonel hires Snake, on behalf of, but not through the channels of, the UN. He goes undercover posing as a rebel soldier to get close, and if confronted, his cover story is that he's a UN inspector. That's it. Pretty simple explanation, really. Just too bad if you click a new game, no one's gonna say what you're doing there, and all you get to see are the moments where Snake lies about what he's doing there. Though I could empathize with any longtime fans' disregard for context, because MGS4 is a fan service game. It's an amalgamation of previous series tropes that have been stitched together into a Frankenstein zombie of misplaced, and for what feels like another first time in the series, misused fan service. As a result, and as a longtime fan, it's easy enough to read between the lines here without needing actually good writing. The typical character roles are there, and they have been immortalized. Why else would Solid and Liquid be in the Middle East together if not to try and kill each other, right? I, I mean, I get it. It's, it's a dramatic dependence on routine, but I've never liked how this game's referential overload overtakes the need for elegant dialogue. Elegant dialogue dies in the briefing sections before each level even begins. In Act 1's case, the Colonel more or less spills clean the beans of the entire game's plot. Snake! Back in the 70s, some evil rich people invented a way to hack the planet in the digital age. Now, Liquid wants to hijack it all for himself. Snake, we must not allow Liquid to hack the planet! Yeah, that's uh, that's basically it. The soldiers' nanomachine network, their ID-tagged guns, the war economy boom, and Liquid's plans to hijack it all get revealed in the same pre-game briefing that explains why Snake's on that truck in the first place. This briefing segment is 15 minutes long and effectively spoils the events to unfold later, but it's not a big spoiler. The screen time and word count of this game's story actually prioritizes what happens in previous games higher than what happens in this game. But at least the Act 1 briefing is optional. Now, I play this game four times, and what strikes me every single time is that the material of the story is not really that complicated, it's not that hard to follow, it's just written horrendously, stupendously, inefficiently. Characters talk their way around a plot that is really not as complicated as they make it sound. Uh, yeah, question. Where were we again? Oh, uh, we were halfway through the first line before the game even starts. War has changed. ID-tag soldiers carry ID-tag weapons. 
Okay, this is another thing. ID tagged guns. See, Merrill explains to us that in the decades since the last game, the world has seen almost every military weapon in the world, including vehicles, get logged into this SOP system that locks soldiers out on a per-user basis. PMCs are plugged into the SOP, and earlier the colonel said that just about every group out there right now that's wanted to preach their politics through violence is using PMCs to do it. Even terrorist groups. So the contradiction here is that both sides of these conflicts fighting each other are supposed to be plugged into the same system. But whether or not that's actually the case <laughs> depends on who's talking where and when. Especially since as far as the gameplay is concerned, it's only the PMC weapons that have been locked. Kojima got the idea for the Patriots in Metal Gear Solid 2 from the lawyers fighting Napster during the turn of the millennium, and it's easy to imagine Kojima watching news of companies profiting from the Iraq War in the early 2000s to come up with the idea of the war economy for Metal Gear Solid 4's late 2000s release, where the science fiction of this game has us suspending our disbelief over a military-industrial dystopia gone haywire. Which is quite familiar ground for the series, and not that far-fetched of a premise to make for some good science fiction military thriller, it's not even that far off. In the fiction of Metal Gear Solid 4 and totally not real life, poor countries have become convenient battlefields for companies making money through unnecessary wars. So instead of World War 3 being this big flashy production, it's more like a heartless but rational strategy to stimulate the global economy. And there's meat to that angle. Someone could tell a compelling and insightful story about the situation of the world in this game, but the nano machines, the Patriots, the SOP system, and basically the entire screen time of MGS4's story is spent with characters so divorced from the real world that they no longer seem relatable enough for me to care. Here's an example. Listen to how these different games introduce their side characters. I have requested the assistance of a military analyst named Nastasha Romanenko. She'll be providing you backup by codec. A female analyst? She's built up an impressive record as an advisor for the nuclear emergency search team. Contact her if you have any questions. She's also an expert on high-tech weapons. Where's she working from? At her home in Los Angeles. California. Seems like a million miles away. I am the foremost weapons scientist in the Soviet Union. And the head of the glorious Granin Design Bureau. This is the Order of Lenin. It is an honor of the greatest magnitude given along with the title of Hero of Socialism to only the finest workers. Emma was a brilliant programmer. She wrote the worm that destroyed the Arsenal Gear AI. Then, Vamp killed her. I used to be an anime otaku. Here's another comparison. MGS3 saves any mention of the Philosophers, the fictional MacGuffin concept that ties its story together, for the end. During the climax, we get a three-minute exposition dump from Volgan. During the final boss, another three-minute spiel. And then a final one-minute reminder before credits. Compare that to how often, and how lengthily, MGS4 describes the shadowy fictional magic that ties its story together. Before the game properly begins, we get a four minute spiel about it from the Colonel, then a six minute spiel from Drebin, then six minutes from Merrill, then six minutes with Liquid, all explaining what the SOP system is and why it's bad. And all those spiels are contained inside of series of cutscenes that are so lengthy that players can spend upwards of 45 minutes barely touching their controller while stuff like this happens. An SOP is just like one of the three topics that gets the slideshow treatment. Whenever concept art starts sliding across the screen, I like to picture the storyboarders panicking as they're reading a script they have no idea how to fill with video. I mean, with cutscenes this long, how could they? Meanwhile, back in MGS1, those very same nano machines, ID locked weapons, memes, genes, and themes were all present, but back then they were sparingly mentioned because they were far fetched science fiction concepts. And that's totally fine, if not the proper way to maintain the tone of having to also be a political thriller grounded in real life's problems. The first hour of Metal Gear Solid doesn't explain how nano machines work, it explains what you and the DARPA chief are doing there before he mysteriously dies just as he tries to say something important. What was the DARPA chief trying to say? Did Snake really die an hour after the sequel starts? Why did the boss defect? These are all dramatic hooks, and... I can't really pinpoint an equivalent moment in MGS4. So where were we? Right. 
Snake sneaking through the Middle East to assassinate Liquid so he won't hack the planet, and on the way we're getting spiels from Drebin and Merrill that go on for way too damn long about stuff we already know, and the whole while I can't help but think of Alfred Hitchcock talking about boring movies as just photographs of people talking. A lesson from one of the greats made painful by how much better Kojima was at that one game ago. The movies in Metal Gear Solid 3 were long, but they were eventful. They had movement, they had music, they always tried to find the interesting angles, and they often had important little bits of interactivity that were fun and funny and profoundly dramatic. They gave you reasons to keep your eyes on the screen. Cutscenes in MGS4 occasionally feature some very impressive fight choreography, but as far as basic dialogue goes, so much of them just fit this droning, quiet monotone that leaves me half asleep. They're just moving photographs of conversations. So Snake's apparently no longer afraid of needles, we see Naomi's working with the bad guy to help Liquid hack the planet, and he's already so good at hacking that he jacks into the battle space, gives everyone heartburn, and escapes. In Act 2, we're chasing after Naomi instead, sneaking through a forest like in Metal Gear Solid 3, but with all these nods to Metal Gear Solid 2 happening. Vamp's the big bad guy this time. We also see the first sparks of inspiration behind Metal Gear Solid 5's zombie enemies begin. I feel it's worth mentioning that usually there would be some comic relief codec conversation or, or easter eggs here, but no, it's just a guy taking a piss. Raiden reprises the role of the cyborg ninja, he helps us out but gets wrecked, and just like last time, the bad guy presses the hack button and escapes. Next up, Act 3 does a balancing act between having some of my favorite and least favorite moments of the game. A lot of fans, in fact I bet the vast majority, really dislike this first half where Snake puts on his Snatcher trench coat and has to trail the resistance through a big city map. And for this game, that's real jarring. Among all the mainline MGS games, 4 is probably the least stealth dependent and easiest of them all. The Integral Podcast actually reminds you to try and play it like a stealth game. Um, I hope everyone enjoying it and I hope everyone finds their way to play it because there's various ways. My recommendation is try try just sneak everything through. It's going to be it's going to be really fun. Yeah, definitely. Play it as a sneaking game. Yeah. Not as a straight up action game. You're going to enjoy it. Yeah, it is. But the first half of Act 3 reverses all of that. Not only is it incredibly punishing if you have an itchy trigger finger, it's incredibly punishing if you just screw up once. But remember that I'm the kind of Metal Gear fan that loves to crank the old games up to European Extreme and S-rank 100% the new games. That kind of perfection or nothing challenge is right up my alley. So I ended up interpreting the trial and error stealth escort quest as Act 3 as more of a stab to turn stealth into the action puzzles of the older games rather than the slow tactical crawl of 3 and up. And I think the theming here also showcases the game's best stab at making a new setting. All that foggy detective noir stuff is your grandpa's idea of a stealth adventure. It's a classy way to evoke the old age of our hero, and it also shows some depth to the worldwide proxy wars happening. This is yet another conflict between international PMCs and local rebels, where you can muck around with the AI on both sides, but it's not fought with open combat in a loud war zone, but instead with the uh, tactical espionage action. Then the second half happens, and we we are reminded that this is an earnest fan service game meant to answer questions that were never meant to be answered. Eva shows up and reveals that the Patriots were the radio support team from MGS3, and that is the turning point where I immediately felt my reverency for this series, my affection for it, begin to dampen. This doesn't make the old games retroactively bad, but going forward from here it definitely left a sour taste that had the next two games fighting much more of an uphill battle. In short, the wacky, likable, friendly side characters of MGS3 are revealed to have been the big bad guys from two games ago all along. And the biggest anachronism in the Patriot pile that twists this knife in me so hard is Paramedic. She's a complete goofball. She's actually kind of amateur. She's still in her 20s and just reads out of her textbook. She's adorably unprofessional. You think I'd drink alcohol in the middle of a mission? Wouldn't you? Hell no. Well, I'm knocking a shot back now. What? Just teasing you. No. But apparently a decade later, she changes careers to become the world's top leading genetic expert who figures out human cloning and conspires to create the Illuminati. All this is because Boss's final speech apparently swelled everyone up into so many tears that they decide to use a stolen savings fund to take over the world and make poorly interpreted readings of her speech real. 
This is a video game. It's pure fiction. They could have come up with any explanation they wanted to, but since MGS4 sticks so hard to this self-flagellating and honestly kind of arbitrary rule of, of always taking something from a previous game and always grafting it onto something else from a previous game, you have this horrifically conflicted, anachronistic mess of a backstory to the Patriots because they're combining what is a legitimately creepy conspiracy from MGS2 with complete goofballs from MGS3. The rocky topography of this whole story is, spoiler alert for 5 or V or whatever you want to call it, a topic they don't attempt to smooth out until after the final boss and after the credits of a game coming two sequels and seven years later. There's so much going on in this story that is just told and not shown. The Patriots always exist off screen, and we barely get an idea of what the war economy looks like from the outside. It's all so abstract. I mean, what does a JD proxy AI satellite look like? What does a Patriot look like? How, how does Liquid's PMC work? Do they have a corporate headquarters office building? Do they have to do their taxes every year like, like normal companies do? <laughs> how does Drebin's ammo get to the soldiers he sells them to on the battlefield? Does everyone have a magical pause menu? Or is his monkey a time-traveling ghost? Uh, question. Where do these people live? Um, okay, so in the Metal Gear Reverse, if your name is an animal, you're basically a superhero that lives off the grid. Oh, okay. I can't confidently claim that this is all self-sabotage. It's a popular fan theory to think that all these dumb developments are Kojima lashing out against fans, but that kind of rebellion seems much more neutered here than it did in MGS2. However, if you do want to prescribe to that theory, these lines from Eva can be good support. They're probably the meanest the game gets about its own fan base. Nowadays, anyone with a computer can get combat training. The FPS games that these children love are distributed for free by these companies. Of course, it's all just virtual training. It's so easy for them to get absorbed by these war games. And before they know it, they're in the PMCs holding real guns. These kids end up fighting in proxy wars that have nothing to do with their own lives. They think it's cool to fight like this. Anyways, the second half of Act 3 grafts the motorcycle escape scene of MGS3 onto a boss that grafts the fury onto Vulcan Raven that grafts onto the mechanics of a helicopter or harrier battle, but thanks to the new control scheme, all you gotta do is shoot at it until it dies. Which I guess means it's a good time to talk about the gameplay. So, a lot of fans also think that MGS4 is mechanically superior to MGS3 and, and oh my god, I can't believe I'm such a 3 fanboy that I can't even agree with that one! Metal Gear's controls now make sense. They have been revamped to meet the standards set by the rest of the set gen action game over the shoulder shooters. Your basic stealth rules are still pretty much Metal Gear Solid 3, where camo and movement speed matter more than line of sight and you don't gotta flip through a bunch of menus to change camo. Most importantly, Hallelujah, sweet mother of Mary, hark, hear the bells! The sweet silver bells of our Konami overlords have finally allowed this guy to crouch and walk at the same time. Combine all of the above and a weapon shop that can teleport you guns and ammo even as you're being exploded to death during a boss fight, and MGS4 becomes a whole lot less strict about the stealth than the last games. Which I feel like ironically, and partly, can be blamed on their new camera system. Because they got rid of a bunch of the old ones. What we've lost from the Soliton Radar's top-down omnipresence to the more modest behind-the-back angle is overhead visibility. And while MGS3's original overhead camera angles were some hot garbage to put up with over the whole game, they turned out to work wonderfully as an extra optional mode once subsistence uh, gave you a behind-the-back angle that would soon become your default. They complement each other extremely well. If you're stuck in tall grass or in the middle of a bunch of walls, you can pull the camera up and peek over. You can also R1 for a first-person view with pressure-sensitive peeking controls that even let you stand on your tippy toes. MGS3's controls may be a maximalist mess, but after weeks of diligent practice, they eventually can be mastered and appreciated. If you spend a week in a dojo in the mountains playing nothing else, you'll come out wishing every third-person game gave you those cameras. And MGS4 is no exception. The Batman vision and X-ray tad guards of modern stealth games are a product of this lack of overhead visibility, and those features had yet to make it to MGS4. Instead, we have the Threat Ring, which mostly does the job well enough, but the early areas before you get the Solid Eye for some kind of overhead visibility had me running into tons of guards that I just had no way of easily previewing ahead of time. Who is doing this? Who? 
even on subsequent playthroughs where I was supposed to know where everyone was. The camera's either too close or the rooms are too cramped to gracefully see around corners before walking into somebody. Furthermore, a camera tends to zoom in way too damn tight if I want to use a cardboard box or something, which will also turn off that overhead intra-wall visibility of the solid eye. I mean, the gameplay's not a fiasco. It may be a mediocre shooter, but it has a really good stealth core to it. I just consider it a wonky middle ground between MGS3 subsistence and MGS5 perfecting their respective eras of stealth. Basically, whenever I asked myself, did the gameplay really get better from 3 to 4, I use a very simple question to help gauge my answer. Can you shoot a poisonous snake with a tranquilizer, pick it up off the ground, keep it in your bags, and throw it at a guard hours later to poison and kill them without negatively impacting your score? Can you put a guard to sleep, shoot out his microphone, break his legs so that he'll wake up a harmless cripple while still maintaining your non-lethal self-imposed strategy of being a pacifist angel? Is MGS4's toolset and level design versatile and deep enough to allow for strategies that wacky? I don't think so. If you want to watch a crazy obsessive fan crank the difficulty all the way up and do a speedrun of MGS4, a lot of that run is going to be a straight line sprint relying on a lot of trank headshots. Whereas MGS3 speedruns are weird to look at, this is not how you play the game normally. To get this good, you gotta learn tricks. A shop in the pause menu and a very situational and lightly used faction system that always favors the rebels are no replacement for the living, breathing ecosystem of interactables in MGS3. All those animals were usable stealth gadgets. Guards had an incredible amount of interactions you could do to them, and I don't know why they took the interrogations out. Also, without 3's abundance of distraction items, the tranquilizer gun feels like a more necessary part of MGS4's arsenal, and pointing and clicking on bad guys' heads is always going to be a far less interesting option than the distraction and stun gadgets that admittedly are there. You got two different kinds of cardboard box for two different kinds of enemies. Sleeping gas mines are now a thing, and the Mark II is an incredibly powerful stealth tool for short-range drone warfare. And the first three acts, even the escort missions, are fairly open-ended stealth sandboxes that more or less feel like a good, but faster and lighter session of MGS3. But the halfway mark through Act 3 doesn't just discombobulate the plot, but it also narrows the level design into something much more strict as well, with the second half compromising a rail shooter and then a boss fight. You know, I, I do have two very important tips for any of you guys if you do want to go back and replay it, and I don't blame you if you do, because I, I know I've been trashing this game, and, and I do consider it a train wreck, but it is a miraculously well-produced train wreck. It's still worth going back and just, like, gawking at the fact that this even happened. And, and when you do, here is one cool way to make it way better. Play one act per day. So at the beginning of an act, you got 15 to 20 minutes of briefing, then 10 to 15 minutes of intro before a nice, long, solid half hour to an hour stretch of gameplay. A boss shows up, there's a little bit of cutscenes before and after, a little bit more of some sneaking before things get less playable with a vehicle rail shooter segment before a 10 to 15 minute outro, unless it's act three. Now what people hate so much is the transition from this outro all the way back to another intro for the next act. When you have that many cutscenes piling on top of each other, it can sometimes add up to like a whole goddamn hour of cutscenes. But playing one act per day means you're not going to sit through an hour of downtime until the actual very, very end of the game. And it also showcases how these acts have a kind of episodic pacing to them, which I think is a little neat. During the briefing, you got 20 minutes where you know you're pretty much going to be safe if you just run around the apartment and take care of chores. I mean, you're really not going to miss much. But during the act, things ramp up. You got a boss fight, you got an explosive vehicle escape sequence, and these things also end on cliffhanger endings. Then you get a save prompt. You know it's safe to leave for now before tomorrow's next episode of Metal Gear Solid 4. Also, ramp up the difficulty. So this is more self-explanatory. I've already explained why I think the game is too easy. On normal, you basically can play it like a shooter and get away with that, but it's hard mode that I encourage. I, I recommend it for uh, prodding you into getting that stealthiness in. There's no European extreme mode, and that makes me sad, but on the extreme mode, they also limit your non-lethal ammo so much to the point where non-lethal strategies just become a pain in the ass by the end of the game. Hard mode is the fine one. That's the one that slows you down just enough to uh, latch on to the scant few bits of gameplay that are there and, and make them last longer, which makes the whole experience have better pacing, which is also helped if you play one act per day. And it's worth imposing those self-challenges, I think. After all, half the reason MGS4 is still a train wreck worth seeing is Act 4. 
So Liquid's adopted the same strategy as what I guess every guerrilla criminal and other underdog in MGS4 is doing, and that is scouring the world for pre-SOP weapons, because he's turned off everyone's guns. Wait. Guns are falling silent across the earth. Wait, he turned up. Hold up. It's the first total ceasefire in human history. How's the White House responding? The public. The president has yet to make an official announcement. But the media is starting to pick up on it. <coughs> the information's gonna be controlled anyway. <laughs> not this time. It's not? The war economy is ground to a complete halt. Oh my god, he did it! It's the first total ceasefire in human history. War economy related stocks are already going into a free fall. Good! Good! But I thought this is what we wanted! Stuff like this has me genuinely worried about these characters' as moral compasses. I mean, I get that, like, as of right now, for, for the next, I don't know, day, no one can fight back against Ocelot since world peace just happened, but how do they not see the bright side of this situation? How are they not talking more about the incredible implications of this very plot development? Wait a minute. Wait, what about all those rebel weapons that were unlocked from the start? Does the colonel just not know that only the PMCs lock their weapons? Anyways, in both this game and MGS2, we're told that preserving the Patriots will ensure the stability of the world's economies and governments, and frankly, I never bought that. They're an evil, all-controlling conspiracy. They're the Illuminati. We are told that the American economy is suffering and generations are failing to prosper under their control, so why do we want to preserve them? Snake, we were created by the Patriots. Insurance that future generations never prosper. If you were watching this and got confused and thought that Liquid Ocelot may actually be on the right side of history here, then congratulations, you just spoiled the end of the game. MGS4 is a train wreck that's still worth watching because of this shit right here. This is cute. I don't know if any fans cared about what happened to Dr. Madnar Petrovich or what happened to Fortune's Railgun, but this is cute. The simple pleasure of enjoying some classic music, a good old golden oldie as you watch the origins of your world slowly decay and crumble around you, that's real nostalgia right there. That's the emotional experience of growing old that this chapter starts off doing a damn good job of conveying. And shit like that is why I will always contend that MGS4 is at least a remarkably well-produced train wreck. God damn, this train crashes beautifully. But when Vamp shows up and dies, we get another dose of that childish melodrama. Sad music plays and strained last words are whispered, and I have to wonder how many fans actually cared about Vamp. In fact, wasn't he kind of dissed in the last game? Listen, there are no such things as vampires. They're just a stupid made-up legend. And if they do seem real sometimes... Naomi shows up and dies too because she has cancer and she's tired of suppressing the cancer with nano machines, so she kills herself. Cancer. I shouldn't even be alive right now. Oh, okay, how did you fix that problem? The nano machines have kept it from progressing. Oh, you're freaking kidding me! Why did you do this? Isn't this like the exact opposite of what you preached before? Snake was carrying around some kind of deadly contagious disease he didn't know how long he had left and Naomi was like, go live, have fun and stuff while you got the chance. And then live. Wait, I know why she did this. Naomi kills herself to make Otacon cry so that that sniper wolf music will play here like the last time Otacon cried here. She dies at the very same spot Frank Yeager died at here. She dies for purely fan service reasons. Such important, big deal ass, character defining things happen for shallow, belating fan service reasons. Why? Raiden shows up to help but gets wrecked. Ocelot hacks some stuff, physically this time, but he still escapes as usual. The game meanders its way through fan service scene after fan service scene, making as many fan favorite cameos as possible for as little justification as possible, on its way to dredge up old questions in awkward places. Hey, remember that time we asked, Do you think love can bloom, even on a battlefield? And then you ever wonder why this scene is so goddamn long and awful? It's because... Yeah, 
I do. I think at any time, any place, people can fall in love with each other. This precedes the microwave hallway, this game's version of the torture scene, and I know I've talked to many fans who have cried during this scene and consider it the emotional peak of the entire series. Yeah, this scene where Snake's butt cheeks are popping out and Raiden's chopping up bad guys with his mouth but he still gets wrecked. I think this managed to resonate with so many people not because the content of the story was what was emotional and heavy, but rather the context of the game in real life and, once again, some remarkable production techniques. A split screen effect simultaneously shows all our cast struggling in their most desperate moment. Sad music amplifies and wails its way into the character's suffering. Meanwhile, in real life, Konami had everyone convinced of their lie that this was going to be more of a mainline series finale, and we mashed Triangle. Oh, we mashed that triangle, so hard that the sinew of our muscles was spasming, stretching and popping, right in tune with Snake's own punishment. This train wreck was so well polished that you can see your own wreckage in the reflection. Leave it to me. Then a post-mortem video message reveals Naomi was apparently a genius programmer as well as a genius geneticist. She, along with a seven-year-old child, made a computer virus that deletes the digital Illuminati and more or less accomplishes Ocelot's goal right there for him, but there's still one bad guy left for us to fight. Liquid. Because even though the two of you are kind of after the same goal, these character roles have been immortalized as permanent enemies. Why else would Solid and Liquid be seemingly anywhere if not to try and kill each other, right? We still have a score to settle. The beating a dead horse metaphor is rendered in splendid detail as these two whack each other senseless throughout the ages, and then Ocelot finally cracks out of his disguise and reveals that he was merely pretending to be liquid this whole time. Oh, God. This is hinted after the fight scene, and then it's confirmed an hour later by Big Boss, who shows up after the crest to talk about... <gasps> Wait, what's he doing there? How can you still be alive? Right. Solid Snake kills Big Boss with a flamethrower in the 90s, and the dude explodes, but the Patriots apparently creep in behind the scenes, put him back together with nano machines, and then Eva steals his body again and starts putting him back together with parts grafted from Liquid and Solidus. Meanwhile, Ocelot convinces himself that he's possessed by Liquid's ghost so that he can fool the Patriots into thinking he's Big Boss by fooling himself into thinking he's a clone of Big Boss. Question. What was the deal with that speech about bringing zero back to nothing? Okay, that's just, uh, that's, that's just Big Boss wanting to kill the founding members of the Patriots, but he's using a computer binary metaphor because they're AIs now. But why? I don't know, but I'm sure that Kojima doesn't actually know how dumb this stuff sounds in English. When looking at what must have happened behind the scenes, it's easy to point fingers at Konami for milking the series, but I don't know if I fully prescribe to more of the George Lucas theory either. I think Kojima just got tired of Metal Gear, long, long before this. He rewrote a more extreme ending to a sappy happily ever after one after much of the staff complained. But creative disputes still happened, and veteran series leads also gradually left. Longtime series co-writer Tomokazu Fukushima, who was there for all the highest rated games, left in 2006. He was replaced by the newer face of Shuyo Murata, who got his start on MGS2, but inherited Fukushima's much bigger role halfway through MGS4's development. Creative Disputes had original translators like Jeremy Blostein, who personally coined terms like OSP and The Codec to get passed over for the second game. For MGS2 and 3, they outsourced translation to a third party that was given much more strict rules, and the woman who did 2 had very harsh things to say about the experience. For MGS4, they still use that same translation firm while also consulting with translators within the fan community. James Clinton Howell wrote some of the first great fan essays about Metal Gear Solid 2. Also fun factoid, within the staff of Intac at the time was one Mark Laidlaw, not to be confused with the Half-Life Mark Laidlaw, but rather the Police Knots fan translation Mark Laidlaw. And I think there's something to be said of this process of moving from a translator who would try to work with Kojima or fight with Kojima to a translator who just plain didn't even like Kojima to translators who are fans of Kojima. Now, comparing the Japanese and English versions of this game is something I would love to go to school for two years to be able to do, but alas, I have only been told by a friend in Japan that the game's domestic dub does not exactly make a revolutionary difference, but it is just about one notch more entertaining than the English version. And here's my friendo's favorite example. 
snake. Fox. Die. Jenny. Fox die, ja, nah, it rhymes, it flows. The, the Japan friend who informed me about this said it was a funny joke that, that diffused the tension of a ridiculous scene. And in English, this thing becomes Fox die, think again. Again. It's not like making a better English translation would have totally fixed the game, but if that means that the characters had a better sense of humor, then that is something real, something substantial that got lost. For that matter, I'm also keeping in mind that there's real ass powerful themes in this game, and I can't stop visualizing an alternate story with a different goal where MGS4 was less about canon and tropes and more about telling a new story more focused on these themes that just got lost in the chaos. Like this whole mental health angle that the game isn't committed to. You have a stress meter that's easier to fill and less punishing to deplete than the last game's stamina meter. The bosses are themed after powerful emotions and they have traumatic backstories that have kept them in a constant state of war flashbacks. That is fucked, yo, and, and you'd think it'd be a bigger deal. Man, if those bosses got more treatment, they actually could have been genuinely terrifying villains. And lastly, Rosa's codec conversations never cease to remind us of some very common sense that doesn't seem too particularly deeply researched about how to keep your headspace clean. I don't know, after trying to follow the events of this game, mine's really not. I need some noodles. And then you have the war economy, represented in-game with an actual interactive system, hooray! But the reason I'm slapping this one on this list is that the dystopic war economy here is a grand concept only explored on a very, very small scale in which dreb and fun bucks are another element abstracted as hell. There's very little depth to it, very few decisions to make. You just do or don't walk forwards to increase your savings account, which will only go up in one direction. And the second reason I feel the need to slap this one down is that we've seen the next two games pull this theme off better, with Big Boss's offshore rogue nations being controllable with spreadsheet management screens that had me feeling less like a one-man action hero and more like a real state-level warmonger. Where thoughtlessly deploying mercenaries off to die in the middle of nowhere for power and profit was a routine gameplay mechanic. That describes the very first line of MGS4, but it's a much more fleshed out concept in Peace Walker and 5. Although, again, I have to wonder how strong this guy's convictions really are when he keeps saying he wants to create a society where soldiers aren't manipulated and disposable. It takes him a while, but eventually he comes to confront this hypocrisy. Oh, and this one, this is easily my favorite. It's, it's a recurring theme that feels very close to the series' heart. The final bullet of MGS3 establishes the series' chronology as a turning point between some kind of perceived old world versus a much more sinister new one. Even in MGS1, Meryl mentions that modern soldiers are from some different kind of era than those she refers to as real heroes. The state of the timeline in 2005 is one where nationalism has turned into stateless neoliberalism, and individualism is suppressed by overpowered intelligence agencies and overpowered companies. That's creepy, that's fascinating, and unfortunately, it's relatable. In this mythos, the moral decay of wealthy influencers happens during the 70s, and it's represented by their creation of the Patriots. And whatever mysteries behind how and why America became so evil in the 70s are probably more fun to solve in your own head than watching the actual really stupid backstory that is the explanation. And here's the big one, the killer. This is the thing that's gonna damn this game's legacy. This has already made it age faster than its predecessors. Just like the snake clones age faster than their predecessors if you wanna make a game theory. <sighs> I hate to put it this way, I hate to say it, but I do consider this game a failure for several reasons. It certainly failed to end the series, it failed to wrap it up elegantly without asking a whole lot of questions, and on a more personal level I feel like it does fail as a fan service game. I, I became a fan of these games, I fell in love with the first three solid games because of the elegance of their plot, the tightness of their plot, how much there was to read into the plot, and 
and a lot of that isn't there with this one, and that's why I feel like I'm a fan who is not being serviced here. Go service yourself. Why do these wolves know this strange lady? Why did Snake decide to spend the past decade getting really good at CQC? Why does he salute Big Boss's grave? It's all fan service, and the worst kind is the easy, patronizing kind where you just strip off some fan favorite female character's clothes and shove a camera angle up her skirt. It's the kind where the game goes wink wink, nudge nudge, man, graphics sure used to be bad, am I right, fellow gamers? It's an exhausting effort to combine, reference, and close off all MGS tropes for some reason, and I don't get the appeal of that goal. It makes a lot of confused judgments about what does and doesn't constitute the quintessence of Metal Gear. Like framing the conflict between Solid and Liquid as some kind of eternal, permanent aspect of the series when, looking both before and after this game, Liquid's really not that big of a deal. He's only, like, villain number three in MGS2, and, and then he doesn't show up at all in Metal Gear Solid 3. He got cut out of Metal Gear Solid 5, and he sure as hell doesn't have anything to do with the MSX games that are still getting referenced here. Liquid doesn't need a doppelganger. His role is not one that always needs to be filled, and sticking so hard to the mythology of the third Metal Gear game, the first solid game, out of a whole series of diverse villains, looks really awkward when you actually... <laughs> when you actually go back and have, have a grand old adventure playing the series in chronological order, which I just did. What would have been a more challenging setup, and what I feel like would have satisfied the fans better with less controversy, is a story that attempts to wrap up the motifs of Metal Gear Solid rather than the minutiae of its lore. The same story, without all this extra bullshit, could have been told so much more elegantly, and we know Koji Pro is capable of that, but... Some fans out there just had to know the identity of the Patriots, and this time Kojima just sighs and complies. This is how a series about making cute anime action movie sci-fi political thriller video games with fun fourth wall breaking gags turned into a series about a man who pretends to be a cat falling in love with a man who pretends to be a snake. MGS4 is the logical conclusion of sequels. It's media perpetuity taken to the extreme, and I don't get the appeal of its marketed goal to bring closure to every little aspect of the entire series. Hear me out here. If you're that fanatical of a fan, if you really love whatever fan franchise you are such a huge obsessive fan over, then wouldn't you want to see it end on a higher note than this? Nothing lasts forever, and we might as well let the creators we love move on and try to make new and better things after they've peaked at their last stuff. It's not that far-fetched of a concept. I mean, why do you think so many people are hyped for Death Stranding? It's a new IP, and I may be more skeptical of a new Kojima game than I was in 2008, but there's something nice about seeing fans get serviced this hard without the need for Big Mama's nipple to pop out in front of Dennis Rodman's naked soda monkey just before he pulls a knife out of the old butt cheek man. So, oh gosh, but what I also wanted to briefly mention was Mount Snakemore, and, and like, why? Why does Liquid build a replication of Mount Rushmore on the side of his battleship with video game characters? It's something that is completely insignificant to the plot, but worth mentioning because of how ridiculous it is. Like, like the entire boss unit of the game, the Beauty and the Beast unit, the bosses aren't worth mentioning and they're absolutely so ridiculous, how can you not mention them? Like, Sonny's stupid...